Hello, and welcome again to Ethics and Leadership. So today, in order to finish off our section on Aristotle, I have found my way into the painting The School of Athens, which uh, is a product of the Renaissance, which is much later than Aristotle, but it's particularly appropriate for finishing off Aristotle for a couple of different reasons. Number one is, uh, as you can see uh, up above me, um, there are Plato and Aristotle at the center of the picture. So Plato, you've actually seen from this picture before, um, he is pointing up at the sky. But Aristotle, uh, he's the guy who looks like he's uh, playing with an imaginary basketball uh, there in the front. Um, what he's doing is he's, he's kind of referring to the ground. And the, the painter thought that this separated this this told about the differences between Plato and Aristotle Plato who was so interested in abstract knowledge and the forms of things that don't exist any place in the world and so Plato is uh, pointing out of the world and in comparison Aristotle who's concerned with practical wisdom actual kind of know-how and uh, a set of different activities that happen during human life and so he's uh, kind of pointing down to the ground. Also, if you were able to zoom in, you'd be able to see that Aristotle is in fact holding his book, Ethics, which is the Nicomachean Ethics that you read from on your first reading. Um, so all of that is kind of cool. The second reason that I think it's an appropriate place to do it has to do with the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a reclaiming of Greek and classical knowledge. And I'll say more about this when we get to Machiavelli, because Machiavelli saw himself very much as a part of the Renaissance and reclaiming classical knowledge. But in general, the Renaissance picked up the picture of the Renaissance man, this well-rounded person um, that, that echoes what Aristotle was kind of trying to put forward as his picture of eudaimonia. Okay, so with that in the background, kind of picking up on what we've already said, uh, let's go on and talk a little bit more about this reading from Aristotle. So Aristotle starts out with a discussion of citizenship. Now, citizenship, as we think about it today, mostly concerns a set of rights that citizens have. This is typical of modern ways of thinking that we tend to start with individuals and their individual rights. Now, there's no doubt that Aristotle's citizens, in fact, had some rights that non-citizens don't. They are, in fact, in a position of power over those people who will be non-citizens. But it's telling of Aristotle that he doesn't define them in that way. He doesn't define citizens in terms of the rights that they have as individuals. Instead, Aristotle, being typical, starts out with the forms of service that they pay. You will remember that people start out, individuals and families are uh, owe a debt to the state, and so they are they properly provide their services to the state. So people can be categorized in terms of what kind of service they provide to the state. And here he says the citizen is one who has the power to take part in deliberative or judicial administration of any state. This is what he's talking about when he talks about the citizen. Now, this might still be a little bit unclear to you because we don't usually have a system where our citizens are actually expected to, kind of obligated to, participate in deliberative process. Now, the closest institution that we have to what Aristotle was thinking of is probably jury duty. So if we think about jury duty as an obligation of citizens that they have to go in and serve on a jury, as a matter of fact, they could probably get in trouble for not serving on a jury. Um, this also fits in the sense that jury duty is not a person's job. They don't go full time for jury duty. Um, people who are citizens vote and they serve on juries, so they serve at particular times when they're called upon by the society to do this. Now, we can contrast the citizen to a, a couple of other classes of people in society. So one is aliens, and by that he doesn't mean little green men, even though that's the picture that's up there. Um, what he means is people who are 
residents of other places that come and live even for a long period of time in the city, in the state that we're talking about. Those people are, do not become citizens. They are treated as people who cannot serve in these particular ways. And so they're treated as a class that is below the level of citizen. Um, other classes that fall beneath, uh, and again, Unfortunately, I'm sorry to the ladies in the class, uh, women would not be included in citizenship, so the jury duty picture that we have here is a little bit inaccurate for ancient Greece. Similarly, slaves uh, would not be included in the category of citizen for Aristotle. These are not the kind of people that he's thinking of. Mostly he's thinking about property-owning men in the city. Now, another class that we should pay attention to, other than aliens, women, slaves, and citizens, is the class of rulers. And again, what's at stake here is the job that the rulers do, the form of service that they give to the society. So mostly rulers measure things. No, that's not right. Rulers are the class of people whose job it is to oversee and organize the society by making laws, by uh, producing the structure, the constitution of the city, of the state itself. So if we think about rulers, we're thinking about people whose vocation is in politics. And Aristotle wants to make a distinction between these, between the citizens and the rulers. And again, in our society, we can think about that on similar terms. So if citizens are the people that participate, that vote and participate in jury duty, the rulers are those who are elected by the people in our society. Of course, Aristotle doesn't think that that's necessarily the best way to go in terms of politics. He wouldn't be in favor of uh, a kind of full-on democracy, as we'll see, but he does make a distinction between those who have their jobs as organizers of the society and those who render occasional service to the society through administrative tasks. All right, so then he wants to know about the virtues of these different classes of people. Now, you'll note that he doesn't actually go into the virtues of slaves or aliens or women. And in part, he thinks that those virtues, as a matter of fact, will be instilled by the citizens and the rulers. So the citizens and the rulers will be in charge of instilling virtue in those other people. And we're also going to see that the rulers are in charge of instilling virtue in the citizens. But Aristotle's not interested in that as he comes to talk about virtue, the ruler, and the citizen, but rather the question of whether any of these, the virtue required, can be the same as human virtue in general. Now, underneath this question is the question of whether, what classes of society can aim for a full life of eudaimonia. So you realize that the human virtues are all part of the good life of eudaimonia. And he wants to know, can everyone in a society achieve eudaimonia, or is it going to be limited to only particular classes of society that are able to participate in the fullness of eudaimonia? Now, as he looks at citizens, he runs into a problem. The first thing is, he says, look, we're going to recognize that not everybody in the society is going to have the same virtues. And this is because the citizens are not the rulers. The citizens have their own jobs. And those jobs are going to require them to gain virtues of their own. So we can see here, for instance, there's a doctor, a teacher, and a mechanic. Well, each one of these will need the virtues that are intrinsic to the art or practice that they focus on. So the teacher will need the virtues of the teacher. They will need the qualities that make them an excellent teacher. But these won't be exactly the same qualities that make someone an excellent mechanic, for instance. Right? Uh, the mechanic doesn't need virtues or excellences regarding how to deal with children. Right? That's central to what the teacher needs. 
right? The doctor will need a set of virtues on dealing with the body, which will be different from the kinds of things that the mechanic needs as virtues in excellence there. So we can recognize that these citizens who serve the society in some administrative functions, yet they have their own roles in society, their own vocations, which will shape the kinds of virtues that they have. Now, Aristotle says these can't be then the same as the virtues of each other, and further, they can't be the same as the virtues of the rulers. To say this would be to say that the conductor must have the same virtues as the choir members. Okay, so what would be the differences of the virtues of a conductor and the virtues of a choir member? Well, the conductor must have the virtue of being able to lead, have all the qualities that he needs or she needs in order to lead the choir and show them when entrances are and hear the overall picture of the choir and uh, might need to have additional knowledge about the music in order to shape it into exactly the form that they want. The virtues of the choir members will be different because they'll need the virtues that allow them to listen to and to gain uh, their, their knowledge from the conductor about what they're supposed to be doing at this particular time. They will have the virtues of followers as opposed to the conductor who will have the virtues of leadership. So he says these then can't be the same. As a matter of fact, he says, so it seems that given that all of these people have different uh, structures, different sets of virtues, they can't all be the set that's identical with human virtue in general, right? So who would have the life that's identified with human virtue in general? Well, there he thinks that the only one who has a shot at human virtue is really the ruler. And this goes back to what we've talked about in the past. Because while the mechanic will be focused on mechanics, while the doctor will be focused on medicine, while the teacher will be focused on teaching, right? It is the ruler who has to know a little bit about all of these things. And that matches up with Aristotle's picture of eudaimonia, that the full human life is in fact not characterized by speciality, but characterized by generality, characterized by a well-roundedness, knowledge, and in fact practical knowledge of many, many different areas, arts, and practices. So it is in fact the ruler who is capable of eudaimonia. Everyone else in the society will have to settle for something short of full eudaimonia. Even though they are necessary in order to produce the state, they won't be able to be entirely fulfilled by it. So the picture that we get from Aristotle then of his city that he's pictured here is a hierarchical city which has on the bottom sets of people, and these would also be hierarchically ordered internal to themselves, Women uh, would be above aliens, would be above slaves. Uh, but then above them would be the citizens who contribute more to their society because they participate in this deliberative and judicial activity of the city. And then above them, the rulers. And as you go up that pyramid, you get more and more potential for eudaimonia. Aristotle, being typically Aristotelian, doesn't think that eudaimonia is an all-or-nothing matter. They're, in fact, different people are capable of different levels of fulfillment. And so he thinks that probably the least fulfilled will be the slaves, although the society should also try and get them to the amount of fulfillment that they can have as slaves. But this moves its way up to the citizen who can experience more fulfillment than women, aliens, and slaves, and then to the rulers, those who have the vocation that might allow them to actually experience the fullness of eudaimonia. All right. Now, that pyramid actually gets a little bit ahead of itself. 
So if we listen to Aristotle, he's got a problem in that he keeps going back and forth between what he thinks is a good form of government and what he thinks is a description of all forms of government. So he tried to make his definition of citizenship broad enough that it would actually be able to cover multiple different types of society. But as he gets into his discussion of virtue, inevitably he ends up talking about better societies because it's only actually better societies that will be able to produce people and classes capable of eudaimonia. Um, perverted societies won't be able to sustain people with true virtue or true fulfillment at all. Although, again, being Aristotle, he has to say something about this and he comes off saying, okay, they might be able to get some relative amount of eudaimonia, even though they will never approach the fullness of eudaimonia. Now, in his descriptive vein, he divides up shapes of government into uh, a, a kind of matrix, which we have then uh, right, right behind us over here. Um, so he divides up, number one, the number of rulers that govern a particular area. And he says there could be one, or there could be a few, or there could be the many, right? Uh, and then he divides up between those which are good governments and those which are perverted governments. Those which are ideal governments and those which are perverted governments. Now, what makes the difference between ideal and perverted? Well, basically, the difference is whether the leaders lead in service to the society or in service to themselves. So, in good societies, he believes that the leaders lead for the good of the society in order to try and make the society as good a place as possible, and in order to help all of the citizens serve as best as they can and achieve as much fulfillment as they can. Whereas in the perverted societies, the leaders are greedy, they are selfish, and they turn the society to their own good and their own interest. Okay? So this said, we can then divide up in our matrices between uh, what one a ruler is, if it's ideal, and one ruler, if it's perverted. So he calls uh, the one ruler, if the ruler is ideal, a monarchy. And here we could have in mind uh, the, the kind of beneficent king, a king that actually has the good of the citizens and, and the other members of their own society at heart, and so the king serves the society and does the king's best. Now, this uh, actually, if it worked, if you got somebody who is an ideal king, if you got, uh, say, the, the person of practical wisdom in there, right, this might be a fine form of government. However, Aristotle recognizes that it's not likely to last long. Unlike Plato, who imagined a perfect society that could kind of be self-sustaining because the guardians would know who to pick next, Aristotle is typically more realistic than Plato. And so he recognizes that over time, even ideal states will tend to devolve into perverted states. Even if you found the ideal king, right, eventually maybe that person's son or going on down the monarchy, somebody would arise who in fact loses their civic mindedness, their sense of service to society, and turns the society to their own interests, just making money for themselves, making power for themselves, and making themselves great. This, Aristotle says, is when a monarchy would turn into a tyranny. And tyranny is one of the worst forms of government, because here you have a single person who is focused on themselves and sucks dry the rest of the society for their own interests. Now, as we go down, we can find that there is another set of governments that is government by the few. And if there are a few people involved, well, Aristotle actually thinks this is a little bit more stable than a monarchy, because at least you have a group of excellent people who exist in social relations to each other. And so it's possible that this could last a little bit longer. And as a matter of fact, what he means by aristocracy goes back to the Greek aristos. 
The aristos are the excellent or the best. So what you imagine here is a kind of meritocracy where the people who get to be in leadership are there because they have excellent character, because they are able people. And so they are the people who in fact should be ruling society and rule it for the right purposes. However, again being realistic, Aristotle does not believe that uh, an aristocracy would be entirely stable. He believes that over time, most aristocracies will slide into oligarchy. An oligarchy, which we've seen before in Plato's uh, structure of different governments, uh, definitely means the rulership of the few. But again, Aristotle follows Plato here in suggesting that what he means by oligarchy is that it's rulership by uh, the rich, by the people who are focused on money. And we can think back to Aristotle's theory of appropriation, that these are people who are interested in unnatural uh, appropriation, people who are interested in money for its own sake, who have kind of become deluded by money and are interested in that above all else. And so oligarchy ends up not being a particularly good form of government. Now, Aristotle also considers the possibility that there would be rule by the many. And here he has in mind uh, a large group of people, though probably not the entire society, even though he's going to talk about democracy. Um, as we'll see, he has particular groups that he thinks of and identifies with these two uh, groups of the many. So on the one hand, he says, in an ideal state, you would have a, a large group of people who were virtuous, uh, that would in fact be focused on the common good, and we'll call this by the generic name a politeia. And a politeia is the general word that he also uses for a constitution. So in your reading, it actually translates this term as, we'll just call it a, a general constitutional society, if it's ruled by the many for the common good, right? So we would have a group of people, a broad base of society, who in fact were virtuous and were fo focused on the good of the society. The problem with that is, it's really hard to maintain a large group of people with virtue. Inevitably, as people go about their jobs, they're going to focus on particular areas, particular things. You're going to need all of this specialized attention, and those people are not going to be able to develop all of the virtues that they need in order to rule. So he believes that a polity is not incredibly stable and often devolves into a democracy. And democracy is, for Aristotle, a, a politics where there's a rule by the many, but everyone is interested in their own interests and no longer interested in the good of the state, the good of the whole, the good of their fellow citizens, but in fact goes and votes and rules in order to get as much as they can out of society, right? So they're worried in some senses about their own rights over everyone else. And ironically, in modernity, this is what comes to be uh, kind of our typical thoughts of democracy, um, at least by the time we get to Thomas Hobbes. But for Aristotle, again, this would be a mess. It would be a catastrophe because basically there would be no common wheel of the society. There would be no common good and the society would fall apart. So again, there he overlaps with Plato. Now, there's an additional element that we should add into this analysis as we're talking about it, which has to do with economics and proper accumulation, according to Aristotle. So I've already said something about oligarchy, which ostensibly means the rule of the few, although Aristotle takes it to mean those who have become focused and in fact uh, fixated on the development of money in the society. This is part of why he thinks that oligarchies will, in fact, be vicious communities. He also thinks that accumulation has something to do with an aristocracy. So aristocrats 
are people who need to be experienced in a wide range of practices or arts. They need to have some experience with teaching, some experience with music, some experience with literature, some experience with sports, some experience with all of these different areas. So in part, the practices of the aristocracy, the practices of the best, will require that they have enough uh, goods that they can support a lifestyle that participates in these many different activities. Now, Aristotle then takes it for granted that the aristos will be amongst the more wealthy in society. He takes it for granted that they will have a certain amount of wealth, and they will have to have this in order to participate in the practices of the aristos. So this is not, in his picture, unnatural accumulation, because they are still accumulating their wealth for the purpose, for the practices of their own role in society, which is to be the rulers, which is to be the aristos. But it does mean that they will probably have more wealth than the rest of society, um, just as uh, those who are citizens will probably have more wealth than those who are underneath them. And we'll talk a little bit in, uh, in a few minutes about justice and how Aristotle justifies this kind of distribution throughout the society. But before we get to there, we also want to talk about politeia and democracy. Because one of the distinctions that he makes between these two groups, and this is kind of assumed by him to be linked to the difference between ideal and perversion, has to do with the economy, economic status of the people that rule in a politeia as opposed to the people that rule in a democracy. So the people who rule in a politeia, that good version of the rule of the many, Aristotle says those people will be middle class people. So they will not be the poor of the society. And this is why when he says the many, we should, probably shouldn't imagine a full-on popular democracy that he has in mind. He thinks that middle-class people will have a greater ability to, to balance between the different parts of life and that they will be, in fact, more virtuous than people who exist in poverty or the poor in society. When he talks about democracy, then, he identifies democracy with the rule of the poor. And he thinks that the poor, in fact, will not have the resources to be able to develop those virtues. And here, he might even be thinking of, like, slaves who come into a position of rulership. And then, so they, they, they upturn the natural hierarchical order of society that he believes is supposed to be in place. And he thinks that this uh, gets out of the way. So Aristotle does assume a kind of relationship between excellence and virtue and economic status. Um, although he doesn't believe that uh, people gain their wealth immediately because they're virtuous. Oligarchs might have a lot of money, but it's not because they're virtuous. He does believe that virtue, at the very least, requires some, uh, some amount of wealth in order to gain and maintain, because you have to have the privilege of having certain experiences. Now, you recall the idea of noblesse oblige, which also must go along with this. So those who would be members of a politeia, who are the rulers of a politeia, or those who are members of an aristocracy, who are in some sense gifted with the goods that allow them to be aristocrats and members of the politeia, because they have received this, they owe it back to society to provide their service in leadership. Now, Aristotle, in many senses, thought that aristocracy was the ideal form of government. If you could achieve a true aristocracy, this would be probably the most stable and the most enduring form of good government, although Aristotle's not under any illusions that you could maintain an aristocracy forever. He thinks all of these things eventually fall apart and would have to be reconstituted. So he also is willing to accept that 
uh, in most societies, since you won't be able to develop a group of the Aristos that will then be able to find their way into leadership. Um, he thinks that a politeia might in fact be the realistic option that most people have to deal with. A kind of rule of the middle class, or he calls it sometimes a mixed government. So something that's not quite aristocracy, but it's also not quite democracy. So it's not falling to the entire peoples. Now, you can actually find this still even when we get to society today because there is in our society a difference between, uh, say, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, so the Senate is a smaller group that's supposed to, supposed to be in office for a longer period of time, whereas the House of Representatives is a larger group of people that is limited uh, to two-year terms. And this actually goes back to a classical idea that perhaps what's best is a kind of mixed government, that those in the Senate would represent uh, aristocratic qualities, that they would be uh, the kind of more excellent, you know, that getting a job in the Senate is more prestigious than getting a job in the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives then represents a little bit more of democracy, a little bit more of uh, the tendency to open rulership to the many. So even Aristotle's ideas are, are continue to be influential, even though ideas by the time America is uh, set forward will have changed a great deal. Um, and even today, it's not clear whether, as a matter of fact, in order to get any of these positions, you have to have a great deal of money. And so we're actually living in more of an oligarchy than anything Aristotle would recognize as an aristocracy or even a politeia. But at least this gives you Aristotle's picture of the different forms of government. Now, before wrapping up on Aristotle, I want to say something about Aristotle's conception of justice. And this is going to both overlap and uh, be different from Plato's conception of justice. So you remember in Plato, Plato was focused on order. And so he thought that justice was a particular kind of order, an ordering in the society where the guardians were in charge of the auxiliaries and the producers, and an ordering of the self where the logos was in charge of the spirit and the appetites, right? Well, Aristotle, as a matter of fact, will agree with him in part because he does think that there should, in fact, be different levels of society, as we saw in that earlier triangle that actually leads you to a kind of picture of aristocratic government and aristocratic society. Aristotle imagines that justice will have to do with a particular kind of order, but that's not where Aristotle starts. Aristotle starts with a kind of more general conception of justice. So, Justice is giving what is due. Now, this is a classical conception of justice. I think in some sense, Plato could have bought off on it as well. And in some sense, indeed, everybody, as we go throughout the course, will find that this can work out, uh, although they'll disagree a lot about what's due to different people. So uh, let's, let's say a little bit more here about what we mean when we get into giving what's due. Well, like Plato, Aristotle can play this off as an individual virtue and a social virtue. So as an individual virtue, justice is the virtue that leads me to, say, repay a person the proper amount for something that they've sold to me, right? So as is typical in Aristotle's account of the virtues, we don't want too much, we don't want too little. The virtue is a mean between excess and deficiency. So if someone sells me a shovel, right, and we agree on the price of $3, I then shouldn't go over and say, you know what, now that we've agreed on that, I'm gonna pay you $10 for the shovel, just because I feel like it today. That would in fact be giving you more than your due in exchange for the good. But I also shouldn't attempt to short you so I say, you know what I've got? I've got this special $3 bill that I will pay for the shovel with. And we actually all know that there's no such thing as a $3 bill, so I'm paying him nothing. 
right? So the just person will be the person who is disposed, habitualized to giving what is due in response to what they've gained. Again, we can see here the idea of noblesse oblige, that those nobles or those rulers of the society in fact have an obligation as just people to give back to the society what is due to the society. Now, how do we figure out what's due in other cases? Well, we could also say in cases of, say, crime, that a person is due in response to what crime they've committed. Maybe a person who steals a Snickers bar must, as a penalty, pay back the amount of the Snickers bar, right? And Aristotle is interested in a kind of retributive justice, but he's also interested in what we might call distributive or social justice. And here, interestingly enough, he puts forward as his ideal a claim about equality. He says we should, in fact, treat everyone equally. However, what he means by this does not come out to exactly what you might think of as equality. And to understand Aristotle, we need to make a fundamental distinction then between numeric equality and proportional equality between numeric equality and proportional equality. So imagine that I have three apples, right? I have three apples and I have two friends. Now, how could I divide up my three apples so that I divide them equally between my two friends? Presumably, you've passed this much math, you can say, okay, so each friend would get one and one half apples. Well, that's correct if I'm treating my friends with reference to numeric equality. Numeric equality is when each person gets the same numeric amount of something. So each one gets one and a half. One and a half, one and a half, they're equal numerically. But Aristotle notes that oftentimes when we talk about treating people equally, we're not talking about treating them numerically equally, but we're talking about treating them equally with regard to some other condition or some other trait. So imagine that uh, I have two friends and they've come over uh, to help me move, or maybe they're not even friends, they're just people that I hired to work for me, and I promised them that I would pay them with apples, right? I, I don't know who works for apples, but this is just the case. Now, one of them shows up and works for two hours. The other one shows up and works for one hour. Now, if I'm going to treat these two people equally, how much is due to each one of them? Now, this is the question in proportional equality. We have to ask, what's due to the person in light of some characteristic that they have. So here the characteristic is having worked for two hours or having worked for one hour. And it seems that if I'm going to treat them equally in proportion to the labor that they have put in, then I would give one of them one apple and the other one two apples. As a matter of fact, if I treated them in terms of numeric equality, I gave each one of them one and a half apples, you might want to say, I haven't treated them equally. Because as a matter of fact, I've shortchanged the guy who showed up and worked for two hours. I have not treated their labor equally, right? So proportional equality treats people equal with reference to some other quality or trait that marks them, in this case, labor. So then, if we're going to treat people equally, equally, in terms of proportional equality, what does it mean to treat them equally? So here we come across the question, how do we determine what's due to people? Now note that what I said to you that I was going to give people in relation to the labor that they put in, that makes sense, it makes sense to us. Because as a matter of fact, our society runs on a system of due proportionate to labor. So we assume this in the background. But that's not what everyone, uh, in fact, gives in relation to. 
So it could also be production instead of labor. Imagine a teacher who gives grades in relation to how well students perform, right? Well, it might be that one student starts off further back in the class, and so they have to work really hard in order to get all of the answers right, where another student started out further ahead, and in fact, they don't have to work to get everything right. But if the teacher gives grades in relation to the final product of their work, then it might be that, despite the fact that they have given different amounts of labor, they in fact are only equal if they're given the same grade at the end because the outcome was the same. So it might be that we could give to people in terms of their production. Or our people do things in relation to their knowledge. Well, here is where Plato sat, of course, thinking that the guardians are due a place of rulership they are due obedience because they have a particular amount of knowledge. And as a matter of fact, you can find this today, where oftentimes uh, people who uh, are into IT, uh, technology things, right, because they have a particular specialized knowledge that we appreciate and need, we will pay those people more than other people because they don't have the same kind of knowledge. Should we pay people in relation to their particular class in society? So this will probably strike you as a bit strange because we live in a generally democratic society, one which is more egalitarian in treating everyone alike. But it wouldn't have seemed odd at all in medieval Europe or even Europe up into the modern times to recognize certain people as members of what they would have called the aristocracy, um, although uh, it's questionable whether Aristotle would have called it an aristocracy, but that there would have been in the feudal system kings and lords and then uh, serfs at the bottom of the system. And everybody was do something depending upon what role in the society they played. Or it could be that people are do something in relation to their particular needs. So set aside how much work they've put into something or what their final product is, what they contribute. Let's look at what people need. So take, for instance, uh, one person who's in a wheelchair as opposed to a person who is able to walk, right? Do, is it due, do we owe to the person in a wheelchair to put up a ramp so that person can access the places that a person who can walk can access with stairs? right? Sometimes we think people are do things because they stand in special need of things. Um, there's also the possibility of reparations. Perhaps because somebody has been treated bad in the past, they are do something now. Now this could be in criminal cases, as I was talking about with the candy bar, where maybe somebody who steals a candy bar has to pay it back, and so the person who owns the store is due reparation. But this also could be over time, perhaps uh, over a number of generations, right, a particular group of people was deprived of having particular goods. And so the society now owes them, it is due to them to receive reparations for the amount that they have lacked over that period of time. Or is what people are due in society opportunity? So maybe what we need to do is not to pay attention to the particular ends that they produce or the labor that they've put in. Maybe we should start establish a, a universal starting point for everyone so that everyone could start out at an equal point, And then after that, we will recognize goods on the basis of their labor or their production or something else. But we say it would kind of be unfair, it would be unequal if we allow people to start out at different points related to each other. Now, the reason that I go through this list is because as we go through, through the rest of the course, most forms of uh, social thought in ethics will adopt some form of do, what's due to people, but they'll adopt many different accounts of what it means, what is due to different people. 
So Aristotle introduces the distinction between numeric equality and uh, proportional equality. But this is a really useful distinction that's going to go on and can make sense of a lot of the arguments that will go on later amongst different philosophers about how to sort out uh, justice and injustice for society. Now, none of this should be uh, confused with uh, what Aristotle is saying. So Aristotle, although he might have a place for a lot of those different versions, when he's talking about politics in the city, he has a very definite proposal. So Aristotle's proposal is that people are due in proportion to their excellence at the art or practice in question. So as he says, if you have a musician, right, and there's a whole set of people who play the harp equally, well, there's no reason to give one of them a better harp than another because they all play the harp with equal skill. But if you have someone who plays with superior skill, right, you want to give the superior harp to that person because that person can do more with the excellent harp than any of the people that were down below. So as a matter of fact, Aristotle says, people are due in relation to their own excellence, their own virtue. And this fits with the general picture of society that Aristotle has laid out. So the aristocrats who are the best, the excellent of society, right? To them is due a disproportionate amount of the goods of society, or we probably ought to say a proportion equal to their own virtue and their own excellence. And this will allow them to continue living lives of excellence as they're able to practice the practices of a ruler, the practices of the aristos, and they're able to maintain themselves in then service to the society because they owe back. They owe back to the society. They've gotten what's due to them and they pay back to the society, right? Because they didn't just get there simply because they deserved it. Luck played a role in it, right? The citizens are due what is appropriate to each one of their arts and those who are better at the arts are due more than what's due to other people. So if somebody is a better mechanic, you ought to pay them better than a person who's a worse mechanic, right? This kind of makes sense. So what's due to people is due to them in relation to their virtue or their excellence. Right? And as long as everyone is given in relation to their excellence, then you will, in fact, have a just society, at least according to Aristotle. And, of course, the personal virtue of justice will be knowing and having a disposition to give to each one of these people what's due to them. Right? Okay, so this basically wraps up uh, my lectures on Aristotle. And what I want to do now is to conclude by going through a summary of those themes, similar to what we did when we were wrapping up Plato, to see where Aristotle comes out on these particular issues that we're looking at. And here again, we will see that there's both overlap and differentiation from Plato, as in part, Aristotle is refining Plato's thought, but in other parts, He's breaking from Plato in thinking that, say, eudaimonia is in fact a more diverse, diversified state than what Plato would have imagined in abstract knowledge. So human nature. Similar to Plato, he thinks that some people are capable of achieving a kind of just life, uh, the life of fulfillment, the life of eudaimonia. In contrast to Plato, he pictures this as the well-rounded life instead of the life of knowledge because he assumes that there are diverse goods which will be a part of this human life. Now, in order to achieve eudaimonia, you have to have the resources to enjoy leisure in order to experience a whole bunch of different parts of society. You have to have natural capabilities that allow you to do this. You have to have the proper moral formation or habituation that has set you into the virtues, that has trained your appetites to go along with the reason. Um, and you have to have the opportunity to rule society. Because without that final kind of crowning practice, you stop somewhat short of full eudaimonia. 
Okay. Uh, what about um, social or individual? Which has priority? Well, here Aristotle has definitely expanded upon Plato's basic disposition to privilege the society over the individual. And so he, in fact, has provided arguments that the individual does not exist apart from the society. Remember that individual baby that, in fact, uh, is trying to pull itself up by its bootstraps, but it can't make boots because it's a baby, right? Uh, so there is no individual apart from society. And so humans are naturally involved in society, but also they are naturally political in a full sense. They are involved in hierarchical relations and human arts or practices that build up or constitute a functioning state. So they're involved in the art and practice of their own family. They're, they're taking care of their family. They're involved in their art or practice of their own vocation. They're involved in the art or practice of child rearing. They're involved in all of these different arts and practices, all as a means of service to the society. Now, in Plato, we explicitly use the term common good. I think that still applies as we're talking about Aristotle here, that he believes that there is a kind of common good that the society is, in fact, the center wheel for all of the members of society who are in it. All right, people and property. So here, again, uh, we get a very developed and kind of nuanced picture where we had a little bit of a simple picture in Plato. Plato believed that although the producers would be motivated by material goods, the guardians probably ought to get past that, and that was really the way that they could avoid being tempted uh, by material goods, by lower things. Aristotle is more realistic. He thinks that, in fact, everyone will be involved in the accumulation of property, but he does make a distinction between natural accumulation, that is, accumulation that gathers goods necessary to human arts and practices. He believes that that's justified. So as long as you're only gathering goods because you need to fulfill your practice of taking care of your family, because you need to fulfill your practice of child rearing, because you need to fulfill your practice of being a mechanic. As long as you're accumulating goods for those practices, that's fine. And accumulating the practices of those things, what you need to do those things, that secures the amount of goods that you need to get. But unnatural accumulation, that is accumulation that gathers more goods than necessary, or treats money itself as if it is a good independent of the practices that you're involved in, or a practice that makes money from money, if I'm loaning you money and expecting interest in response. These are all unnatural forms of accumulation. They are not just forms of accumulation. As a matter of fact, participation in them will habitualize people towards vice. It will lead them to be confused about the nature of reality, the nature of goodness, and they will lose track. They will become the tyrant, the oligarch. They will uh, be the kind of people that you have uh, ruling in a democracy who are concerned only with themselves. So, Although he's, again, different from Plato, there is an overlap in the sense that money, if it's not focused on the right purposes, focused on the right practices, in fact becomes a, a source of viciousness in society. Equality or inequality? Well, uh, for Aristotle, there's a sense in which human beings are naturally unequal and should exist internal to hierarchical relationships. And this doesn't mean that, although though the hierarchical relationships are natural, it doesn't mean that nature automatically makes sure that we're put in the proper place. There are times when uh, natural slaves gain rulership over natural masters, etc., etc. So, so there is a great deal of flexibility about this. And Aristotle can talk about a sense of equality with which people should be treated, but it's a kind of proportional equality that is uh, that treats people in recognition of the particular merits that they have, in particular in relation to their particular excellences. And this again gets him to the natural hierarchy because he believes that there are some people who have kind of natural excellences or at least excellences that they've been able to achieve that are greater than other people. And so there is a natural division, even if he can call it proportionately equal, 
there's a natural division between what kind of obligation people have uh, and what kind of goods should be given to them. The shape of government for Aristotle is ideally an aristocracy, which is the rule of the excellent few over the citizens, then the women, the aliens, and slaves. And that's what we see in that triangle from earlier. Uh, but uh, politeia, which is a kind of mixed government, or a rule of the middle class, might be more regularly achievable. And so he leaves that open that maybe that's a, a kind of a, a possible way to go other than aristocracy. He also thinks it's possible that you could have a monarchy, although he doesn't believe that you're going to find one person that's actually that virtuous very often, and he thinks that it'll decline into a tyranny uh, at uh, an early stage. Okay, the purposes of government for Aristotle. And here, as with Plato, we are in a kind of society of mutual service. So the purpose of the government is to shape people to participate in the highest level of fulfillment which is found in social and political society, uh, given their natural capabilities and the needs of the society. So those who find themselves the Aristos in his ideal society will participate in eudaimonia in ordering the society, but what they order it towards is the greatest fulfillment of everybody else given the limitations of their situations. So the citizens should be as fulfilled as they can be, given that they're focused on their particular vocations. Even slaves should, in fact, be as fulfilled as they can be, given their natural limitations, and that they're really not capable of controlling themselves. The fact that other people take over, control over them, is in fact a form of service to them, because they're supposed to be ordering them for the good. So we have a society where everyone is, in some sense, supposed to be serving each other. Again, the idea of the common good, uh, which we raised in Plato, continues on in a more developed way in Aristotle's thinking. So what is it that authorizes leadership for Aristotle? And again, he's not going to buy into a system where people are authorized by a particular process, a voting process. He doesn't even think that, that leadership is justified uh, by the good monarch handing it to the monarch's son, because the monarch's son might not be virtuous. It's not clear that it's due to the monarch's son to become the next leader. What actually makes somebody, uh, what authorizes them for leadership is their own excellence or virtue. So leadership is due, the leadership position is due to people who are the aristos. In particular, this means people of practical wisdom, gained by experience in many areas of life. This is available, again, to those with natural capacities, resources, uh, and the ability to gain such experience. Probably the wealthy in the society, those who have the ability to have broad experience, and a well-rounded life. Okay, so at this point, uh, we are at the uh, end of our lecture on Aristotle, and uh, for next time, actually, I'm going to give you uh, a lecture that sets up Augustine, and so we're going to talk about a little bit of the transition between ancient Greece and the Roman Empire, and what had changed by the time we get to Augustine with the rise of the Roman Empire and uh, the development of Stoic philosophy and uh, the influence of Christianity as it started to spread through the Roman Empire. So until then, I will see you in our next video.